Thank you. Good evening. We're here for the John Willis Lecture Series tonight. We have a couple of great speakers, Dr. Sam Maxwell, and we also have Dr. Williams out of Fort Myers. So we're grateful to God for them, and, and we thank God for these men that can bring the word to us today. And we want to make sure that everyone is tuned in and call somebody have them to tune in as well so that they can receive the blessing also. After our praise and worship, the next voice that you will hear will be Dr. Sam Maxwell, and following him will be Dr. Leon Williams. my heart. 
know that God's grace, God's mercy, and his love is amazing. Won't you sing it with us?
Amen. Thank God for that praise team. Thank God for the praise team. Let us pray. Father, we thank you now as we come in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we appreciate you. Lord, we ask that you move now by the power of your spirit. We thank you for allowing your word to go out. We know when it goes out, it will not return void, but it will accomplish that you sent it out to do. Lord, we love you now, we praise you now, and we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the providers, Lord, that you put here to deliver your word. Lord, I ask that you would use us now in such a mighty way that, Lord, as your word go out, we would all be blessed exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us and through your word. We thank you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dr. Sam Maxwell. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank God for each of you, my brothers, in, in suffering. Just kind of first share with you that. Uh, Coach Haynes uh, w will not be with us. Uh, he called and uh, expressed the fact that he wouldn't be, be able to be with us tonight and uh, things that, he, that he, just, he just could not get around. He's okay, <laughs> but uh, he just was unable to make it tonight. And we're grateful, however, for him uh, giving, giving this team the opportunity to launch out into a new a uh, new field of endeavor as it relates to the teaching ministry of the Mount Pilgrim uh, Baptist Association. Uh, Dr. Dr. Haynes is always fully engaged in every, any and everything that's going to make for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We also want to thank uh, uh, Pastor Ship for coming in and sharing with us. He's on our team as well, and, and of course, uh, Congress President Leon Williams will uh, will come and follow along and follow me in, in answer to our our question for this particular series. So, so this is the first uh, uh, quarterly meeting of the John Willis Lecture Series, and uh, uh, Dr. Haynes will give you for, get for further discussion on why uh, uh, John uh, Willis, why John Willis, former pastor of the New Hope. Missionary Baptist Church, and uh, um, um, and so we'll leave that for him uh, in, a, in one of our next next occasion. Uh, but it's just to pay homage to a faithful servant of our Lord, uh, and uh, uh, here in the Mount Pilgrim Association, more specifically the New Hope Missionary Baptist Church in uh, uh, Tampa. Um, the, the question that this series will will deal with, well, first of all, the objective. Of, of, of this particular portion of the instruction for tonight is, the objective is New Testament church development. The objective is New uh, Testament church development. And the, the, if, you, if you break that into pieces, it's, it's all about trying to get our churches uh, uh, to develop along the line that is in keeping with the principles and practices that we find in the New Testament, in the New uh, uh, Testament, that our churches could develop and be vibrant, uh, effective, uh, uh, evangelizing, uh, serving churches like the First Baptist Church there in Jerusalem and the First Baptist Church at Corinth and the First Baptist Church uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Galatians and on and on and on. We want to borrow, want to borrow from, from the example of those churches to become the churches that God really wants us to be. Our objective is to help all of our churches uh, to develop new, to, to, to develop, uh, new, have, to, to accomplish rather New Testament church uh, development. The question that we'll deal with, the question that we will we'll deal with is this. Would New Testament churches 
develop a more firm foundation and stronger fellowship. If Paul's epistles were the primary curriculum, if the epistles of the Apostle Paul were the primary curriculum for our churches, would we develop more firm of, a more firmer foundation and, and, and a more, and more stronger fellowship within the body? Well, uh, the strategy that, that, that we want to uh, uh, use to approach this question, this, the strategy that we want to use to approach this question is grasping God's word according to the author's intent or instructions. Grasping God's word according to the author's instructions. In other words, we want, to, we want to search the scripture in a manner that would be in keeping with what God has said in his word. How, how should we really approach the scripture? Well, he's given us uh, a, 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 a proof text that, that we can use as a, as, a, as, a, as a point of departure. And that is found there in Hebrews, that Hebrews chapter 1, uh, beginning at verse 1. And it says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, Amen. whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And so the old preacher would say, let's unpack that. <laughs> let's, let's unpack that. God, who at sundry times, Sundry is a word that is synonymous with portions. Uh, uh, and, and, and from this idea, we get the, we get, we get the doctrine of dispensation, that, that God, God's word came to us at different times in different ways. He dispensed his word in different, in different times and in different ways. That's what he means by sundry times and in divers manners. Then he gives you uh, a couple of the uh, uh, sundry times. He spake in times past. He spake in times past. He spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. When did he do that? In times past. Yeah. He's not speaking through prophets today. He did that in times past to the fathers, which means Old Testament. Verse 2 says, hath in these last days, which deals with the dispensation of the age that we're in, since Jesus hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. So, conclusion then on this, this beginning discussion of this, uh, this strategy and, uh, uh, that we're talking about, how, how we approach and interpret the scripture must be guided by God's Son. That's what he said. Hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, and he's in charge. Yeah. That's what he means. He's appointed heir of all things. So how we approach the scripture, brothers, how we approach the scripture must, must, must be, must interpret, we must interpret scripture uh, as, as we are guided by Jesus. So, 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 so let's, let's, let's revisit, let's revisit 
Jesus time. Let's revisit Jesus time. One of the first things we see that when Jesus uh, began his ministry, uh, he, he began by giving his uh, uh, 12 uh, disciples or apostles, he gave them, listen to this, he gave them a restricted commission. He gave them a restricted commission. In Matthew, Matthew in, in, in chapter 10, verse 5, beginning at verse 5, it says, uh, and, and he says, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, go not, restricted, go not into the way of the Gentiles. And into any city of the Samaritans, Samaritans enter ye not. Yeah. It was restricted. It was restricted. Verse 6 says, but go rather or go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, every time this word preach comes up, in, in, every time Jesus used this word preach, it always has with it an evangelistic approach. Every time this word preach is used by Jesus, it's about somebody that's lost and need to hear the gospel. That's, 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 that's every time when Jesus uses it. And, and, so, and so, so, so Jesus gave that. You can clearly see Jesus gave them a restrict. They were not to go to anyone except. Why? Because what Jesus, Jesus in, 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 in the gospels, Jesus did not come to start a church in the gospels. In the gospels, Jesus, Jesus came to, to inaugurate the kingdom of heaven. That was the message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And you and I both know that you can't, you can't establish a kingdom when you crucify the king. <laughs> so, 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 so what Jesus does, what Jesus does then, the, the, restricted, the restricted commission is no longer valid. So... The next thing Jesus does with the 11 remaining disciples, he gave them a revised commission. He gave them a revised commission. It says in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. He had a restricted commission. He sent them to, he had, he had, he had a, 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 a revised commission, rather. He sent them to the uttermost part. They were supposed to go everywhere and, and, and proclaim or, or evangelize or, or, or preach the gospel to every lost person. See, when you approach this the way Jesus gives it to us, then, 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 then we see that, 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 those, that the, the work of the 12 didn't go well because they, it's hard to have a, king when you, a kingdom when you crucify the king. So Jesus then gives a revised commission and says, tell everybody. Mm. Now, he's up, now he's in church mode. Yeah. He was in kingdom mode, but now he's in church mode. Yeah. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus gave a revived commission. And, and, um, and those of you who are familiar with the book of Acts, you, you know that those guys didn't really care much about that uh, uttermost parts of the world. They really, they, they really never really got with that. that they, 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 matter, of fact, matter of fact, these guys got stuck in Jerusalem. They got stuck in Jerusalem. So much so that in Acts chapter, in, in Acts chapter 1, uh, it's Acts chapter 8, rather, in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, we see, we find out here that, that in, after the restricted commission and after the, after the revised commission, we discover circumstances required 
them to work the commission. And Acts chapter 8 verse 1 shows us that circumstances required them to work the commission. What was the circumstances? Well, uh, verse, Acts 8 1 says, and Saul was consenting unto his death. Yeah. And at that time, there was a great, here it is, this is the circumstance, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, a great persecution. And they were all scattered abroad. Listen, they didn't sit down and say, hey, let's go all over the world and proclaim the gospel. No, they wasn't going nowhere. But circumstances, the circumstance name was Saul of Tarsus. <laughs> he scattered them throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria. Everyone left except the apostles. These guys just never got with that into the, all the world thing. It just, they just got stuck in Jerusalem. Yeah. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching. Again, that's, that's, that's the word about evangelizing. That's proclaiming the gospel for salvation's sake, preaching the word. Saul's uh, 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 persecution uh, literally forced the church at Jerusalem to do what they really never planned to do. And that was, it forced them into evangelizing all people everywhere. So what we've, what we did, we, what we've seen now, as we look at Jesus and his approach to, uh, to, 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 to guiding us uh, uh, through the scripture, so he, he, he's the one in charge. We must follow, what, what we, we must walk in his footsteps and see where the bread crumbs lead us. The circumstances required them to work the commission. And lastly, Jesus finally ends up preferring only one commissioner. Well. The 12, the 11, they never got with the global evangelism. All right. They never really came to grips with anybody else being saved other than the Jews. Not really. In Acts chapter 9, verse 15, the Bible says, But the Lord said unto him, talking, talking to Ananias, because he wants him to talk to, Paul, to, to Saul. Ananias talked to, talk to Jesus like he don't know what he's doing. You, you, you do, uh, you, you, Jesus, you don't know this man. <laughs> I've been hearing some bad stuff about him. Jesus says, Go thy way. In other words, Jesus said, Would you, would you just do what I told you to do? He says, for he, Saul, is a chosen vessel, listen to this, unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings of the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Jesus started out with a restricted commission. He, 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 he gravitated to, to a revised commission. And then, and then the circumstances required them to, to hit the commission. But then finally, Jesus, Jesus finally settles in on having only one commissioner. Saul of Tarsus was redeemed, called, and ordained as the chief I would say only apostle for all things Gentile. Now, if you don't know what a Gentile is, it's somebody that's not kin to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <laughs> that, that's us, y'all. <laughs> so, so, so but just, 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 just to move out of the way, uh, 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 one last thing I want to I want I want I want to give you, and these are these are just thoughts that you need to that you need to consider and and, and work your own way through it. Uh, uh, regarding regarding the great compromise that took place as it relates to the pre the salvation of the Jews and the salvation of the Gentiles, and and should the Gentiles uh, be saved uh, uh, w w without being circumcised or be saved after being circumcised. And in Galatians chapter 2, verse 8, that there seems to have been a, a compromise uh, uh, that, 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 that has, apparently was pushed by the guys in Jerusalem. And Paul says, whatever. <laughs> 
says in, in Galatians 2 8 says, For he for, for he that worked effectively in Peter to the apostle of the circumcision. He calls Peter the apostle of the Jews. The same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And the point, what we see here is that they had, they, 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 those guys in Jerusalem just came to the conclusion, Paul, you do the Gentile, Gentile folks. We'll do the Jews. But that is not what Jesus said. Jesus says, go ye therefore into all the world. And when he said that, he was talking to those Jewish apostles. And they never went like he said, go. So he picks Paul and sent him out alone. Of course, he picks up Barnabas and Mark and, and Silas and, and, and Epaphroditus and several other guys along the way, Titus and Timothy. Uh, he builds him a team since he, since he started out as a lone ranger. Verse 9 says, when, when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that the grace, the, the grace that was, a, was given unto me, Paul says, they gave me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. And listen to what they said, that we should go unto the Gentiles, and they would stay and work the Jews. Okay, so here's my point. The apostle Paul, the, the apostle of things, all, all things Gentiles, is the one that Jesus used more than any other apostle to not only plant the churches and stabilizing the churches, stabilize their churches, but also give church leadership development manuals, 13 of them, if you will, yeah. that can work wonders in churches still today. So in order to develop New Testament church churches, we need New Testament material. The apostles of all things Gentiles, wrote 13 epistles yeah. to churches and pastors so we can know how to do and get the church to do what God calls us to do. Father, thank you tonight. Thank you for Dr. Haynes for giving us this, this, this spot, this platform, and God, we don't know where, where this is going, but we are, we're grateful for the start, for these men who are here, uh, God, Brother Todd and, the, and our AV and Brother Leon and, and uh, coming up next and Brother Ship uh, guiding us through this evening in support. We just pray, God, that you will uh, continue to keep us, Lord, as we, as we search for ways uh, to, to, to help churches become churches that you've called us to be according to New Testament faith and practice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Brother Leon's coming. You know, we, we, are, we just, we just going to get, get it done, y'all. We're not going to keep you here all night. Good evening. It's good to uh, be here this evening, and we're excited about the opportunity to participate in the John Willis Lecture Series as a part of the mighty Mount Pilgrim Baptist Association. And this uh, particular series is going to be enlightening, 
and helpful to many of us who are leading uh, local New Testament churches. The series is uh, a part of the uh, arm of Mount Pilgrim's Christian Education Ministry, and it is uh, under the umbrella of New Testament Church Development. It's designed to aid church leaders in developing and strengthening their local, their local churches. Uh, we heard Dr. Maxwell earlier uh, spell out the uh, intent, aim, and our goal of the lecture series uh, with the question, would New Testament churches develop a more firm foundation and stronger fellowship if the Pauline epistles were the primary resources or resource for the preaching and teaching ministries. And so I come to uh, share uh, some uh, information regarding the leadership of the Apostle Paul, uh, talking about uh, the master builder of the church and how Paul proceeded, how he initiated and proceeded to be the one person that the Lord Jesus Christ used in order to plant and develop and strengthen local churches throughout the region of Asia Minor. So we'll begin by looking at uh, Paul's leadership tonight. What kind of leader was this guy? This teaching session will combine Luke's historical account of the life of Paul along with the apostles, the apostle Paul's epistles explaining his, get this, his revelatory ministry and how today's church leaders can best lead, grow, and strengthen a local fellowship of believers. I call it his revelatory ministry because he received divine revelation from God. And you know what he did with it? He wrote 13 letters. <laughs> That's what he did when he received the divine revelation from God. He wrote 13 letters to various churches and pastors on how a local New Testament church should function. Every leader of a church should have some idea of God's purpose and plan for his life. Yeah. Every leader of a local New Testament church should have some idea of God's purpose and plan for his life. The Apostle Paul has given us a pattern for that. His writings reveal several qualities that must be discovered before one can rest assured that he is fulfilling the will of God for his life. In his second epistle to Timothy, his son in the ministry, Paul records these words. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Let me read that for you one more time. Whereunto I am appointed, that could be translated ordained, a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 11. Paul, first of all, recognizes his spiritual gifts and how they influence how he fulfills God's will, how he fulfills God's will. It wasn't so much about God's will for his life as it was God's will, period. So I'm going to share some principles pertinent to learning how, as a local New Church, uh, New Church Testament leader, to fulfill God's will or to fulfill the will of God. Yes, sir. First thing I want to highlight tonight is the fact that 
one must be directed by the will of God. One must be directed by the will of God. And we're going to use Luke's historical account of the life of Paul to help us get started tonight. We notice in, in Acts chapter 11, 12, 13, we have an historical account of the Apostle Paul's post-conversion experience. His early church life experiences. And, and, and once he gets saved, as you heard Pastor Maxwell declare earlier, God sent him to Ananias, who explained to him what the Lord would have him to do, baptize him, matter of fact. And then the Apostle Paul spends time in Tarsus. Well, the scattering of the churches have now scattered as far as Antioch. And Antioch, found there in chapter 11, at the end of that chapter, becomes a church that is multicultural and multiracial. And we'll see different people, Jews as well as Gentiles, are in that church. And as Barnabas gets news and the apostles in Jerusalem get news of the church in Antioch growth, while the church in Jerusalem is on the downward slide of growing. And the church in Antioch is on the upward move in their growth and in the numbers of their fellowship. Barnabas now decides that he needs to find this guy by the name of Saul to come and help them in the church there at Antioch. Acts chapter 13, verses 1, 2, and 3 reads this way. Now there were in the church that was in Antioch, at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manan, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And the Bible says in verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, listen to this, Barnabas and Saul, for the work where the church. And these leaders are, are preachers and prophets. Preachers are what we call forth tellers, F-O-R-T-H, T-E-L-L-E-R-S. We forth tell the written word of God. The prophets during that day, because the word of God had not been given in its totality, they were foretellers. They could tell us things that were going to happen that had not yet happened. And we find that in Paul's prophetic ministry in chapters like chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, in 1 Thessalonians chapters 2 and chapters 4. And, and we see his, um, his prophetic side uh, giving us information regarding what we call eschatology, end time things. Well, here, these teachers were in the local church at Antioch, and they were leading this growing congregation. So what happened in Paul's life to help us understand how we can best lead a local New Testament church using the Apostle Paul's life as a pattern, as a mold, as an example? Well, first thing we find out is 
Fulfilling God's will takes place in a local church first. It takes place in a local church first. Notice Barnabas goes and gets Saul, and he brings him to the local church in Antioch. Too many of us try to lead a church without being in a church. Each and every believer should find them a local church so that we can begin the growth process. Paul not only had to grow as a believer, but he had to grow as a leader. And to grow as a leader, he became a part of a local church with challenges, which required him to learn not only through the revelation that God was giving him, but by practical experiences. If we were to use Paul's life as a pattern, we will notice how God initially sent him to Ananias. From there, he was in Jerusalem around the apostles, and from there, he was with Barnabas. These men gave the apostle guidance to where? To a local church. The same apostle would later write to Timothy and say to Timothy in the book of 1 Timothy chapter number 1, he would write to him and say, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer. What did he command him to do? To stay at the local church. Stay there and be a source of encouragement and leadership. So Paul began his ministry in a local church. And this is going to be helpful for all of us who are leaders in churches. Uh, get in a local church as the pattern uh, reveals here in the Bible so that we can learn how church is to be done. Secondly, we notice something else, that Paul was obedient to the command of God. If a leader is directed by the will of God, are directed to fulfill the will of God, we must be obedient to the command of God. And we know the role of the Holy Spirit there in the early church. Luke declares these words in, in the book of Acts chapter 13, verse number 2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, or the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. He said, separate me, these two men, set them apart for the work whereunto I have called them. And we notice that Paul has been given the call to a certain group of people. How important was Paul's obedience to this command of God the Spirit? Listen, that decision has ultimately led to the gospel being spread to almost all areas of the world. That one decision on that day, at that moment, in time, in that church, while worship was happening, they made a critical decision that initiated or became the genesis of the, uh, of the gospel being spread to the uttermost part of the world. Now, how important is that to be in a local church and to obey the command of God? Thirdly, thirdly, Paul preached the word of God faithfully. Notice in the book of Acts chapter number 14, he preached the word of God faithfully. Now, faithful preaching has its challenges. Faithful preaching is required not just when it's comfortable, but it's required during a pandemic like COVID-19. That th this is what we call faithful preaching. Preaching when you are not seeing anybody in an audience. And you know Paul himself writes to Timothy said, preach it in season and out of season. And we paraphrase that by saying when they want to hear you, when they don't want to hear you, when they're in the house or when they're not in the house. It says in Acts 14, and it came to pass in Iconium. This is Paul and Barnabas on their journey that they went both together into the synagogue 
of the Jews, and so spake or preached that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up, listen to this, the Gentiles, and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time, long time, the text says, therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. What am I saying? What is that verse saying? Paul and Barnabas continued to preach God's word even when they faced difficult circumstances. The Bible says at Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against these two brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly in spite of the opposition that they faced. And then God confirmed their message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. They preach faithfully in spite of the Jews stirring up opposition against them. They preach faithfully. What, what, what does this have to do with the leadership of Paul for a local dude? There are some Sunday mornings when we won't want to preach or Wednesday evenings or Tuesday mornings or whatever day and time it is that we are preaching. We will not want to preach for whatever reason. Somebody's going to upset you. Paul and Barnabas didn't even think along that vein. That, that was not even a consideration. They were being faithful to the call of God to take the gospel to the Gentile. So first of all, we noticed that they were directed by the will of God. Secondly, they, they responded to the grace of God. This is another important element when we, talk, when we are talking about leadership in a local New Testament church, and we find this in the life of the Apostle Paul. There was a response to the grace of God. First Timothy chapter number one reads this way. And you'll see me using various verses, but these verses are also thought of chronologically. And so we can understand how Paul developed his ministry and grew from the early church, which we find him planting churches through the book of Acts. And then in the midst of planting churches and moving about, he also wrote epistles. And so we have this concurrent work going on by the apostle as he does the will of God in the life of Gentiles. Watch this in 1 Timothy chapter number 1. He's writing to young Timothy, whom he has left in Ephesus. In verse 12, he says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. This is Paul rehearsing to Timothy his call to ministry. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me. That's number one. Who hath enabled me. That's number one. Given me the ability. For that he counted me faithful. That's number two. He counted me. He enabled me. He counted me faithful. And then thirdly, putting me into the ministry. So Paul says he did three things for me. He enabled me. He gifted me. He gave me the supernatural ability to do this work. Then he counted me. He saw my faithfulness in spite of challenges. And then he put me into the ministry. And then Paul said, this is my history as a leader. This is my pre-Christ days. Notice verse 13, who was before, before what? Before I met Christ on the Damascus road, a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But here's what happened on the road to Damascus. I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. 
And then here's, here's the grace of God. Here's what, here's what his response is because of the grace of God or to the grace of God. He says, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. He, you, you, I'm reminded here of Paul's letter himself to the church at Ephesus, chapter 3, verse 20. And, and you know, he can do exceeding abundantly and above all that we may even ask or think according to the power that works within us. Paul says God's grace exceeded, listen to this, the blasphemy. God's grace exceeded my persecution. God's grace exceeded my injuring, harming, physically hurting people. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So why, why, why is this important? Listen, leaders of local churches, this apostle Paul gives us an example of how we should respond in a local church, in leading a local church, sustaining and growing and developing a local New Testament church, we don't respond to the difficulties and the people. We respond to the grace of God. A leader who understands, a leader who grows the church understands the love and the kindness of God in their life. As a result of experiencing the grace of God in one's life, leaders experience a sense of urgency to perform God's will. Understanding the grace of God is essential. It's essential for one to recognize the importance of leading God's people. This level of leadership is dependent on one's willingness to serve and be a steward of God's possessions. Henry Blackaby writes, the power of the call of God. He says a leader has an absolute sense of urgency because of this desperate condition of the sheep. Jesus sent the disciples on a mission to help them. A leader has an absolute priority and commitment to prayer. Prayer is a relationship with God where in his presence he reveals who he is and what he is about. A leader is unconditionally, uh, is unconditionally related to Jesus Christ as Lord. Unconditionally. The slightest whisper of the leader's Lord is heard and responded to immediately. A leader must dwell with and under Christ's absolute spiritual authority and demonstrate this in his life. What am I saying? I'm saying a leader leads well who understands the love and kindness of God in their life. And what we learn from this is Paul is teaching us to relearn to how God has been toward me, not how people are toward me. We are leading sheep. Paul's life becomes a clear example of how we do this if we're going to be master builders of churches. Thirdly, Paul, I mean, secondly, Paul says these words, he talks about a leader whose life is yielded to the Holy Spirit. We notice in Acts 13, the Bible, the Bible clearly says that when they were worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit spoke. While they were in harmony, in tune with, while they were under the control of the Holy Spirit, listen, he spoke. These leaders are symbolic, Paul and Barnabas, of a life yielded to the Holy Spirit. This is why the apostle will write to the same church at Ephesus that Timothy is pastoring and, said, and say, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit of God. Listen, the grace of God will motivate one to do the will of God. The grace of God, Paul's experience on the Damascus Road, his, his, his recollection of his prior life as a blasphemer, as an injurious, as a persecutor, his recollection of that, and then his recall of how God's grace covered his life of treating people that way 
far outweighs and exceeded whatever came his way, which caused Paul, even though there in, in Derby, he's taken out or to the edge of the city, stoned and left for dead. Paul rises up and keeps on preaching. Great leaders respond to God's grace and possess the fortitude to face difficult challenges. Let's look at how we face challenges as we move forward and close out. Thirdly, thirdly, a leader, a leader confronts challenges through faith in God. Listen, listen. We respond to these challenges it, by the grace of God. We're directed by the will of God. We confront challenges through faith in God, through faith in God. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What was Paul saying? Paul saying, hey, listen, in Galatians 2.20, Paul is saying, listen, Christ lives in me. Watch this, watch this. Christ doesn't just dwell in me. Christ lives in me. In other words, Christ has full access to my whole life. Uh, we don't, many, too many times, leaders, we treat Christ like we treat guests in our home. We allow them to come into the living room, sit on the couch, or in one of the chairs there, but we do not allow them to have free access to every area of our home. Paul says, Christ lives in me. He lives in all areas. He has full access to whatever is going on in my life. In Acts chapter 14, the letter of Luke writes, Luke writes, verses 19 and 20, and there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, watch this, who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as disciples, as the disciples stood around about him, he rose up and came into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Well, Here's what happens as Paul confronts challenges through faith in God. When they stoned Paul, Paul was challenged by his own ethnic group. By his own ethnic group, his own people, people that looked like him, <laughs> people that talked like him, people that had some of the cultural idiosyncrasies of another person of the same race. During Paul and Barnabas' stay in Lystra, the Jews stirred the people up. F.F. F. Bruce who writes these words regarding Paul. He says, Paul was badly knocked about. When years later, he says to friends in Corinth, once I was stoned, this was the occasion he had in mind. He must have been knocked unconscious for those who stoned him the Bible says, dragged him out of the city supposing he was dead. And many believe that it was at this point that Paul says, I was caught up in the third heaven and I saw things that I cannot utter. And Paul, having been stoned to the point of, of, of being uh, supposedly dead, obviously was bruised and battered rather badly. It was probably a grotesque scene of the Apostle Paul as they battered him. So he faced challenges, and he faced challenges from his own ethnic group. Secondly, he was challenged by Satan. He was challenged by Satan. But he faced challenges, or he confronted challenges, wow, by faith in God. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Satan himself, Paul points him out. Paul calls his name. He 
hindered us. On another occasion in, in, in our 1 Corinthians 12, or 2 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about how there were messengers of Satan sent to buffet him. Paul could identify uh, his challenges, but do you think they stopped Paul from, from, from placing, from, from employing and exercising his faith in God? No, it did not. And no, it did not. Notice in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, in verse number, verse number 7, he says, unless I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, not Satan, but the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Uh, Paul had a clear understanding of why his challenges were so severe. <laughs> it, it, had to do, it had to do with ego. It, it had to do with thinking more highly of himself than he ought to. Therefore, he could submit himself to the will of God, trust that God was leading him even during these times of difficulties. Paul explains a continual problem he experienced with Satan. Satan hindered him. There were messengers of Satan to buffet him. And he prayed for God to remove the thorn. We saw that in the text. However, God answered with grace. Each of us face challenges that will move us to spend time in prayer for deliverance. I'm talking about leaders who are master builders of local New Testament churches. We must spend time in prayer for God to deliver us. Not only was he challenged by his own ethnic group, somebody ought to get that one tonight, and he was challenged by Satan, but he was also challenged by his flesh. He was challenged by his flesh. This is a part of the Apostle Paul's life as a leader. Romans 7 Verse 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, not around me, not coming toward me, not trying to run me down, but evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of, the, the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, in my members, another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Paul says to the leaders, Paul's life speaks to us that many will face Christian battles. And, and with, with, with facing that battle, there must be a desire to do the will of God, but struggle while actually doing it. But struggle while actually doing it. Struggle is a part of, master, of a master builder's life of a local New Testament church. And so we struggle because we desire to do the will of God, directed by the will of God. You got to respond to the grace of God, <laughs> and, and, and you got to face and confront challenges by faith in God if we're going to be a leader, according to the life of the Apostle Paul. So in preparation for leadership, every potential leader should count the cost. All leaders must understand the price to be paid to lead. An aspiring leader of God's people must have his heart, a, must have in his heart a willingness to pay a high price. Jesus talked about this in closing, Luke 9, verse 57 through 62. He says, and it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said to him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said to him, 
foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man have not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury the dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said to him, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus demands complete loyalty from his servant leaders, from his master church builders. Every leader's commitment to follow the Lord Jesus will be tested. God has committed to building his church because it will restore people to a right relationship with him. Great sacrifice is required in order to accomplish that task. So when we think about local New Testament churches, we think about the Apostle Paul's life, and we think about his specific aim was at lost Gentiles. And the challenges he faced, not only going and performing or employing or fulfilling the will of God, but the opposition and the challenges from his own ethnic group and from Satan and from his flesh. What a challenge. But at the end of Paul's life, you and I both heard him say, I fought the good fight of faith, <laughs> and I finished my course. Let us pray as Dr. Maxwell come and challenge us with some Q&A. Father, we thank you, and we love you, God. We pray, God, that that has uh, enlightened and helped some of the, those in our audience to understand what it means, uh, preachers and ministers, uh, uh, help them to understand what it means to lead a local church and to cause it to become strong and, and to become firm and the membership grow stronger together in fellowship. We thank you now in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Praise God. What a, what a lesson. Amen. Uh, we're so grateful. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, Paul's life is the, is the model, of course. Uh, of course, the chief model is Jesus, but he, he sent Paul to represent. <laughs> Amen. What a, what, what a model. But, Brother Todd, do we have any uh, individuals that, uh, that have inquiring minds and want to know? Okay, All right, we, we can do that. Um, uh, certainly, I uh, want you to know, if you're on, um, uh, if you want to send a message or a question in, uh, we'll, we, we, we'll, 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 there are some things we can do, some house cleaning chores we can do, and some giving information. Why don't we, why don't we start right there, uh, and uh, then we'll get back, uh, see if anybody will send any questions in. There you go, at the bottom of the screen. Okay, there you are. There are two options for, for giving. There's the Cash App uh, 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 for Mount Pilgrim or the uh, Mount Pilgrim Association, uh, uh, Association website. you find uh, the, uh, the giving uh, app, the giving area there, too. So um, if, you, if, if you've been helped... Uh, and you want to you want to assist in, in in encouraging these kinds of endeavors. We're we're starting out, but our, our goal, of course, is to expand and grow and and be able to uh, 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 have some guys that uh, 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 that uh, have great uh, reputation for conducting these kinds of um, 
uh, sessions. Um, but we certainly thank God for uh, Dr. Williams and what he has um, uh, challenged us with uh, tonight. So if there's anyone who um, have some questions you might want to ask, uh, or listen, if you want to do it this way, if you don't want to get, get it done tonight, uh, certainly you can email uh, questions. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Williams to come uh, and give you, give him your email address. I'm going to give you mine. You can send any questions you might want to send to me to I Samuel four three seven at gmail dot com. That's I Samuel or First Samuel. That means there's a second Samuel. <laughs> I Samuel four three seven at gmail dot com. If you want to send me a, 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 a message, come on, Doctor Leon, and give them your email address. Uh, in the event they want to uh, send, oh, there's okay. There's mine on the screen right there. And uh, thank you, Doctor Maxwell. We uh, you can reach me at L E O N S as in son, J as in Jesus, L-E-O-N-S-J, at Comcast.net. L-E-O-N-S-J at Comcast.net. We welcome your questions. We want to know. This will help stimulate and uh, motivate us to continue uh, to point out those necessary principles and practices that can help us uh, build strong uh, fellowships, uh, and, and, and strengthen our membership. We, we certainly want to see that happen in all churches of the Mount Pilgrim Baptist Association and any others who may be interested in um, uh, developing, further developing uh, their local New Testament churches. Thank you so much for tuning in with us tonight on Facebook Live, YouTube, and, and also whatever the means that uh, you had access to watching us tonight. We are so grateful for the opportunity to share with you all. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, we're going to go ahead and prepare for, for the ship to come and, and, uh, and close us out tonight again. Thank you so much. And for those of you who are experiencing this virtual uh, uh, experience tonight, I want to uh, certainly give, hats, uh, give, give words of appreciation to our, our, our executive pastor here at the First Baptist Church of Progress Village, uh, Pastor Tom Hammond. Thank you, Brother Todd, for... Uh, coming in and assisting us tonight, Amen. You know we don't have one of those one of those applaud boxes like they have at the football or the baseball game, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Come on, brother Ship, and uh, give us some parting words and close us out in, in, with a word of prayer. Thank you, Doctor Maxwell. Also, want to say to um, uh, Doctor Sam Maxwell. I want to say thank you for opening up the pavilion. Amen. First Baptist Church of Progress Village. And uh, we're, we're just grateful for that. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If all hearts and minds are clear, we're going to pray. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Father, we thank you now as we come to the close of this session, but never from your presence. Lord, we ask that you would bless now as we have received from these great teachers. Lord, they have given us a word in due season. And Father, this word, if we just take it and apply it to our lives, will give us great insight in what you have in store for us. Lord, even as we move during this time, we ask that, Lord, you bless every family that is listening and, Father, all of those that will yet listen as they come on later and look at Facebook and look at this through their means, through YouTube. Lord, we're grateful to you for allowing it to be. We pray now that the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with these, your people, now and forevermore. And all the church said, Amen. 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 Thank you.